It's great to speak with you today, Nick. Uh, today, we have an interesting topic. I'm looking forward to hearing your, your views and experience on uh, leadership development, and it's at the intersection of mindfulness and speech act theory. Uh, before we start, can you provide a brief background of yourself? Sure. Um, you know, I'm an, I'm an operations executive. I've been in uh, different roles uh, for most of my professional career in business. Uh, first as a consultant with the Boston Consulting Group, um, and then uh, in two different uh, supply chain and operations leadership roles at Feeding America and a uh, relatively new company named Corbion um, that was recently uh, had its name changed and, uh, and is in the bio-ingredients business. Uh, prior to that, I, I had a five-year stint as a U.S. Naval officer in the submarine force and uh, have spent a lot of my career really focused on uh, in operations roles and leadership roles and in people development roles, which is part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you today about uh, this topic. That sounds, that sounds interesting. Um, so before, can you first um, explain, uh, so what is mindfulness? Yeah, mindfulness is, is uh, what I would say a, a new and evolving term actually. And it, I think it means a lot to uh, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For me, um, it, it's really uh, kind of a state of, of being in balanced, balanced from a mind-body standpoint or centered, and really being very self-aware um, and, and, uh, and really focused on what you're doing, who you're with, and the, the task at hand. Um, it's, it's, uh, I think has a lot of its origins in, in uh, what I would call Eastern practices. Uh, meditation, etc. But I think it extends well beyond those historical stereotypes into into the realm of really modern science and neuroscience. And there's a lot of very provocative research in this area for anybody that's interested. Obviously, I can't go into depth um, in this venue. And what about speech theory? Speech act theory. Uh, what is that? Speech act theory is uh, is another uh, decades old theory that was developed by a, a gentleman named Fernando Flores and several other innovators in the world of uh, communications and, and communication theory. But it, it essentially has to do with defining the types of moves that individuals make linguistically carrying out uh, their lives. And uh, a, a framework for it or an example of it would be uh, what's called the core commitment cycle, where one essentially uh, makes a request of someone else. That person has to assess your request and determine whether or not they can, they can uh, both acknowledge it and commit to fulfilling on, on that request, at which point they've made a promise. And then to close out that cycle within speech act theory, you have to complete the quest and then uh, from the requester determine whether or not the conditions of satisfaction have been met. And uh, as I described some of the leadership development work that I did, you'll see evidence of that core commitment cycle being practiced and the effects that it creates with regards to trust building, um, which is a critical enabler of effectiveness for any individual in any professional domain, quite frankly. And it, it has huge implications for the personal domain as well and, and how people get along and, and how relationships develop. So how did you... Um... How did you work with or combine both of these concepts, the mindfulness and speech act theory, to develop leaders? Can you talk about some of the practices that you use? Yeah, and, and to good question, Dustin. And to, to uh, provide some context for your readers and listeners, um, we actually developed a program um, at, uh, at my former employer where we had roughly 25 customer service representatives that had perhaps the most difficult jobs in that business. Uh, they, they were essentially at the center of all of the heat uh, between external customers, the sales force, and all of the internal functions that had to engage to resolve any sort of customer service issue. And um, as a result, they were in extraordinarily stressful jobs. And quite frankly, many of them weren't equipped to remain centered in that highly, highly volatile environment. And so as I was thinking about 
how we would equip this group to handle um, some of the increasing challenges we were experiencing in our business with, with customers continuing to expect higher and higher service levels and quicker turnarounds on everything and, and, and uh, you know, all the typical things you'd expect with a continuous improvement in an industry, um, combined with a lot of internal changes we were experiencing, it occurred to me that, that for these folks to really be successful, um, ultimately they had to be empowered to decline requests in a positive, dignified way and craft promises with customers of all sorts that they would be able to successfully keep in order to build trust. Because the, the status quo was that they were forced to consistently make promises that would require hero heroism to fulfill. And that was, that was not a sustainable model. And so as I started thinking about what we needed to do with this group to develop them as leaders and what we needed um, and what would make that sustainable, um, I, I engaged with an executive coach who was an expert in mindfulness and uh, speech act theory and, and a host of other important leadership development uh, frameworks. And essentially, she and I worked together with my customer service manager to create a program that consisted of, of five parts. Um, we, we started by defining the outcomes for the program, which were really oriented around um, creating a sustainable customer service model for the business that would inspire customer loyalty, which would ultimately lead to business success. Um, and from there, we defined key leading indicators of those outcomes, because quite frankly, those outcomes can really only be measured on a pretty long timeline. And so we were looking for something shorter term and more directly related to our work. Um, and so the, the key leading indicators were an important component of the framework. And then, and then essentially there were four, four different areas that we built, all of which fall into this realm of mindfulness and speak jack theory. Um, the first was creating an engaged and centered mind and body for these staff members. So we developed practices that would help them do that. We created a new lexicon. So essentially using a different set of words to describe actions than one would normally use, it really created a different way for these people to interact, and it allowed us to formalize and monitor the degree to which behaviors were changing in the group. We also employed some of the concepts from an HBR article uh, and framework called Promise-Based Management, which was really the philosophy for the whole program, that if you, if you build trust in an organization among stakeholders by keep making good promises and keeping them, then everything all of your people need to do becomes easier, more efficient, and quicker. Uh, pretty fundamental philosophical belief that we had to have in place to drive the success of the program. And then the last piece was that core commitment cycle that I mentioned. Now, those things in and of themselves are not practices. Um, they were the overall framework and structure for the program, which we ran for more than a year in order to make it sustainable. The practices, though, um, were, were far more interesting. As part of this program, we had, we had a monthly workshop with our, with our coaches, and part of that workshop involved training our minds and bodies to actually decline requests with dignity which is something that most human beings have a very, very hard time doing. So to practice that, we actually had, uh, it, was, it was kind of like scenario based, where an individual would uh, walk towards another individual holding in their hand a request. You could do it with just your hand or a piece of paper. And then the other individual would essentially center themselves, take a deep breath um, and, and become kind of mindful of where they are and what they're doing and then slowly step aside, put their hand on that individual's back and walk them to the other side of the room by, by literally creating an example physically of a decline of a request. And I give that particular example because declines are so difficult for anyone in business or in a customer service function to offer to a customer uh, because you never want to have to do that, but inevitably you have to. And so conditioning these customer service reps to be able to say no with dignity to a demanding customer when they make an unfair request or a salesperson was a really powerful practice that enabled these folks to really, what I would say, mature professionally as leaders. 
And uh, it was also a rare, very powerful practice for uh, the leadership, myself, my customer service manager, and everybody in that chain of command to demonstrate on a regular basis as well, supporting those individuals when on the job after training, they actually made those leadership moves to decline requests. Really, really powerful culture and behavior changing stuff. Oh, how can these um, practices and the concepts that you've been working with be developed further and improved and to help more, uh, more companies and more people? You know, um, it's interesting. When, when I embarked on this journey with uh, the support of, of this coach, um, you know, I had spent two or three years engaging slowly in the practices of, of mindfulness and, and having a, a centered mind body when engaging with others and dealing with challenging situations at work and at home. Um, and and I, I had seen a lot of the benefits that that offered me as a leader. And so I was kind of sold on the concept from the get-go, um, but uh, there, I faced a lot of resistance from folks that simply weren't as familiar with these somewhat uh, new age, if you will, uh, practices. But I will tell you that, that um, in order for, quite frankly, I think any organization or team can benefit from work like this. And I can't, I certainly can't in this venue go into enough depth to really make the case for it. Um, and so one thing I'll do is I, I will make some information available in the not too distant future as a case study so that others can, can read the details. But but to specifically answer your question, Dustin, I think the, uh, a critical prerequisite is to have a leader that understands and is willing to innovate in the realm of leadership development um, and make a relatively small investment from a cash standpoint in, uh, in their staff. And I think, I think at the end of the day, a year of training, the way we structured it, cost us maybe two to $3,000 per person to do this. Which, when, and when I compare that to the ROI of this work in terms of the, the enhanced productivity, the reduced turnover, the, improve, the improvements on customer satisfaction, uh, KPIs, um, and, and ultimately the outcomes that those things are going to drive in terms of loyalty and revenue growth, um, the ROI on this work is extraordinarily high. But really, you need an engaged leader. You need um, a commitment to consistent training over time. We did it for a year and we could have easily justified another year of, of this type of training and work with our teams. Um, and I, I, I think at the end of the day, you need a bit of a burning platform. Like any successful transformation program, there needs to be a good reason to really double down and invest in leadership development for, for a, you know, a significant portion of, a, of an organization or a large team. Well, I look forward to um, hearing um, how things develop, and if you and you're welcome to participate and share with our supply chain community how things are going in, in the future. Yeah, I'd be I, as as soon as I get that done. It's it's one of those things that you know it's easy to push off when other priorities come up, and because of uh, the nature of of a well written case study. But uh, I, I will definitely forward you uh, that content and a link to it once I get it published on LinkedIn. Great, and thank you for sharing. My pleasure.